try to be always punctuate. Uh, I welcome you all, those who came from abroad, uh, those who came from here, and most and above everything, I welcome my Ovid's family, everybody. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to start this conference uh, that was uh, uh, organized by Moshe, Philippe, and myself uh, in the memory uh, of Ovid. Uh, we'll start uh, with, uh, as you all have the uh, uh, new agenda here, or the plan of the conference, there's a small change from the previous one that you received in, uh, since Francesca could not come at the last minute. Uh, we'll start with some uh, opening remarks. Uh, we will run the first session in this room, and then the rest of the conference will be uh, less intimidating and more of a conversation type. It will be held in the room upstairs, which is the uh, regular seminar room uh, of the School of Economics. Um, let me uh, pass the torch to Philippe. Philippe will start, and then Nisim will uh, speak. Philippe, please. Okay. Thank you. you have to take this. I have to take this. Record it. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Take this. It's okay. Hmm? This is, uh, this is for the camera and this is for... So I need two? Yeah. Okay. Give me two. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Dear Mrs. Yosha, dear Mr. Yosha, dear Ayela, dear colleagues, uh, dear friends. So we are here, all of us, of course, to honor the... Uh, memory of Ovid, but I thought that as a short introduction, uh, I should try to quote you uh, for once, not uh, John Maynard Keynes, not Milton Friedman, not Bob Lucas, not the American Economic Review, but instead, forgive me, uh, the Babylonian Talmud, because it offers us actually some reflections uh, about the relationship between teachers, colleagues, and students, which I think are relevant to understand uh, why and how uh, Ovid brings us together today. So. If I, if, if I may uh, uh, quote you briefly, uh, be uh, reassured from the uh, tractate called Tanit, page 7b. So let me tell you this little story, which I think, uh, uh, I hope you will uh, appreciate. So the Talmud tells us this little story that uh, Rabbi Nachman bar Yitzhak said uh, the following thing. He asked, why are the words of the Torah, the Torah, the Jewish law, which is also the same word for teaching, education, why is it compared to a tree? And because it is indeed said in the Proverbs that uh, the Torah is a tree of life for those who cling to it. And the answer that is being given by the Talmud uh, close to 1500 years ago is that in fact this is to teach us that just in the same way that a tree, which in um, Hebrew of the time, if I'm not mistaken, is the same word as the wood, just as the tr a small piece of wood ignites a large one, so it is said that young scholars sharpen the minds of older scholars. And in fact, this begs for somewhat of an explanation, and this was given to us, uh, so why, why, what's, what's the relationship between uh, the, the wood and the uh, sharpening of the minds? And so in fact, the uh, French commentator, Rashi, explained that in fact the sharpening of the minds occurs because the young scholars keep asking questions to the old scholars and they pester them, okay? So students, if there are some here, please take note. And indeed, indeed, the Talmud goes on. It's, the Talmud says this, you know, this is the essence of what another rabbi, Rabbi Hanina, said. He said, I have learned much more, I've learned much from my teachers, and actually from my colleagues more than from my teachers, but from my students more than from them all. Okay? So this also begs from my explanation because it's not obviously clear what's the relationship between this and the previous uh, part of the text. And in fact, the explanation for the last part of this text was given by... Uh, uh, some book, somebody called the Marsha in the uh, 15th century, and he said, you know, why is it that we, this, we have this hierarchy between uh, colleagues, I mean, teachers, colleagues, and teachers? It is, he says, because in fact, students ask more questions than colleagues, and colleagues ask more questions than teachers, okay? And in fact, so, from this, I think, we learn, actually, who Ovid was. So, first of all, he was a questioner, a relentless one. He asked questions about everything. 
Okay, and that I think it was his value to all of us. He wanted to know. And also he was, because of that, a mind sharpener. Okay, I had the privilege, which is a bit strange, uh, for, because I think he, he was older than I was, uh, to be his teacher. But I think I learned indeed from him much more than from uh, my teachers and from my colleagues. Uh, so uh, in this way, in a strange way, he really became uh, my teacher. And I think this is an experience which uh, many of us share. And also, it's like wood. Science is like wood. It transmits fire. It transmitted enthusiasm for economics, for science, for truth, for life. And I think this is what brings us uh, together. And as such, I think, uh, like this fire which lives on, uh, I think is uh, still among us. And we are all gathered here, his teachers, his colleagues, his students, to honor his memory because in, many, in, all, in all these ways, it touched uh, our lives. He, uh, and, and therefore, in a sense, I, I view this occasion not really as a sad one, but rather as a celebration, as a proof, if we need one, that actually enthusiasm and questions are the, find the foundation of uh, science and knowledge. And for this, too, I think uh, we have to uh, thank uh, Ovid. So I miss him like we all do here, and I miss him because he ignited us all, uh, like this fire which uh, lives, us, lives on. So he, we, he, so he ignited us, his teachers, his colleagues, his students who are here also today. So his flame, nevertheless, is among us still, and this is actually probably uh, the thing which we are here to, uh, to say and to, uh, today and to be witness of today. So thank you all for coming here to honor his memory and to uh, celebrate his intellectual and human legacy. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, we of its family wish to express our gratitude to the Begler School of Economics, the Bank of Israel, and the Pinchas Sapir Forum for having undertaken and organized generously the present conference in his memory. We are grateful to the head of the school, Professor Itzhak Gilboa, and his predecessors, Professor Manuel Trachtenberg in particular, who was very close to Oved during his difficult days. To the faculty and staff of the school, including Mrs. Anna Ayash, Oved's assistant for several years, as well as to the members of the organizing committee, Professor Moshe Bushinsky, Daniel Zidon, and Philip Vell. It is an honor for us to be in present at this session where so many distinguished scholars and friends from Israel and abroad are attending and taking an active part. For the last 17 months, we have been missing Oved, his smile, his acute yet unhurting sense of humor, his wise views and remarks expressed around the family table on Friday evenings where some of his colleagues from abroad attended to and honored us. We miss his natural authority in the family, being the eldest son. We miss his savoir vivre and joy of life, combined with genuine modesty. We miss his elitistic intellectual agenda, alongside sincere egalitarian approach to social issues. We miss his patriotic views, together with human universal approach. All are strengthened by fruitful international ties and companionships. His background led to this synthesis. Ovid learned and studied in various institutions in many countries. Dutch kindergarten in The Hague, Jewish school in Stockholm, Hebrew school in Jerusalem, English school in Milan, American overseas school in Rome, French lycée in Abidjan, Hebrew high school in Rehovot. Ovid graduated in Bar Ilan University during his long and successful service in the Navy, after which he completed his master's degree 
at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. With a generous university grant, he made his doctorate studies at the Harvard School, at Harvard University of, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Following his two years stay at Brown University, Providence, Ovid found his academic home here in Tel Aviv University. He rarely spoke about himself, so we knew very little about his academic activities during his lifetime. Only after his passing away, we gathered from his colleagues in Israel and abroad, as well as from his students, some aspects and activities. His two main personal virtues were modesty, according to the words of Psalms, chapter 131. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. His other main virtue was an uncompromising integrity, both intellectual and ethical, as defined in Psalms chapter 15. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh in righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that doth these things shall never be moved. Ovid acted always with supreme sense of responsibility. So he did in the last year of his life when he struggled very courageously against his fatal and sudden illness. He made every effort possible to conclude his academic obligations. He took upon himself the teaching at the university and mentoring his students, the, the preparations for the conference in Modena, Italy in June 2003, which he attended two months before he passed away. The drafting of an article and lecture for the Banca d'Italia CEPR conference in Rome, the writing of the article for the Jubilee book of the Bank of Israel that was completed by the joint contributions of his friend Dr. Ishai Yaffe and his disciple Dr. Sharon Blay. Based on his notes, the drafting of joint articles with colleagues from abroad, the maintaining of working talks with the head of the school and members of the faculty and so on. In the last week of his life, he told us the following significant words. I'm quoting, not every struggle is vincible. And in sh my short lifetime, I managed to do a lot. I want to conclude with a philosophical theological consideration that I referred to in my words in October 19, 2003 at the conference in Rome that Ovid wished so much to attend. Two main schools in medieval Jewish thought tried to explain the subject of the immortality of the soul. The mystical one, dominated by the Kabbalistic thought that followed the Neoplatonic doctrine, claimed that the human soul ascends from the material body to its divine source. The other doctrine that was rational and influenced by the Aristotelian legacy, whose prominent spokesman was Maimonides, claimed that only the supreme part of the soul, namely the intellectual one, is immortal, being an integral part of the general intellect. I do believe that Ovid's intellect remains in many senses with us through his writings, teaching and discussions. We are therefore very grateful to the Berkeley School, its heads and faculty, particularly Professor June Flanders, as well as her assistant Ziv Nir and Natalie Zitzer, for their active contribution in creating the personal website of Ovid and the publication of his articles in two volumes presented in this conference. These are impressive indications of Ovid's intellectual heritage to remain with us. Thank you.
dear family, colleagues, friends, Ariella. I do not know how to start, but I do know how to end, so I'll start with the end. I really miss you, Ovid, and forever will. A lot will be said about Ovid's academic achievements in this conference, so I would like to share with you some of my experiences with Ovid on a personal level. I got to know Ovid when we met as students some 15 plus years ago. Israeli seems to be open, but they are actually quite reserved. When you get to talk about the intimate things is when you really find yourself close to a person. And over the years, we learned a lot about each other. As Ovid used to say, there are good and bad things about this fact. The good things, he said, is, if, is that if I had ever wanted to destroy you, I can. Unfortunately, the bad thing is that you can do the same. I took this to be the highest degree of trust from a really true friend. Since our political opinions were as far apart as east from west, or right from left, we could not really talk about these favorite topics among Israelis. So we were restricted to more down-to-earth issue, the families, the friends, and our philosophical view of life. As all of you know, Ovid and his family lived for a while in Providence, Rhode Island. At the time, we lived in Connecticut, so we had many opportunities to meet and walk together. We spent numerous weekends walking on a paper that we never published. Maybe because we always wanted to make sure we will need to meet again. It is hard, almost unrealistic for me to talk about Ovid's in past tense, as the long conversation we had into the nights are as vivid to me now as they were then. While we were often caught in a race to succeed and do more, and while Ovid had his ambitions in the profession, he never lost sight of what was really important in life. His family, his wife, his kids, his friends, and his country. Every time we met, first I had to give him a detailed overview about the recent developments with my daughter, who was born with Down syndrome. There were times when I was anxious to hear about his recent successes or tell him about mine, but we always used to respond. In translation, leave the nonsense aside. First tell me about the family. Occasionally he did not but that only because he had first talked with my wife, who he claimed was the normal one in the family, just like his wife, Ariella. Ovid could have been very successful in any American university, but he preferred to be where he felt most comfortable, in Israel. He was very devoted to Israel and everything connected to Israel. He was not a big talker, but when you brought up questions about the School of Economics in Tel Aviv, it was hard to stop him. He always had plans for the department and the students, and he always had optimistic views about what can be done and should be done, and what would make the department in Tel Aviv a center for research, a major center for research in economics. Even though for most of the time, we lived far apart, we always found opportunities to meet and usually with the entire families. The last time we met was in Rhode Island just before the summer when Ovid diagnosed with his disease. We spent the weekends playing soccer, basketball with the kids, barbecuing and talking about the future. This was the last time I saw Ovid and it is very nice event for me and my family to remember. Ovid's interests spent man in many areas, in an era where people choose or feel forced to specialize in very specific area, Ovid was a unique all-around economist, and he was a source of great pride for his co-authors, colleagues, and above all, his family. People in the profession know very little about his service in the Israeli army, specifically because he did not 
like to talk about it. Ovid served in one of the elite units in the Israeli Navy and was the commander of a warship. In a country where everybody likes to brag and exaggerate about all the things he did, Ovid was a unique person. He said very little about his service and was only concerned about whether he did all the things he should and could have done. I'm sure that if we had few more Ovids, the country of Israel would have been one of the most prosperous countries on earth and the world a much more pleasant place to live. Ovid was a great husband, a very dear friend, and a great colleague. But above all, he was a real match. And he will, and he forever will be remembered like that. I really miss you, my dear friend. Dear, dear family and friends, Ovid was for me a mentor, a colleague, and a very good friend. At my first meeting with Ovid, I learned instantly about his major characters, the willing to help students and spend his own precious time on them with no self-interest, and his enthusiastic approach towards research. I met Ovid in 1994 at the Bank of Israel. Ovid, who started working as a consultant of the research department, came to talk to me with Ishai about the Israeli banking system. At that time, I was working on my PhD dissertation, and I had a problem with my model. When I told Ovid, he immediately offered that we will meet for several times and talk about my research until we solve the problem, and we did. At those meetings, I also learned that Ovid is a very creative person. He did not only know all the economic literature, but also had many original ideas. Since then, we became colleagues and we wrote several papers together. During the years, I enjoyed talking to him about the current events in the local financial and money markets. Ovid had a unique interest in the Israeli economy and wanted to influence the decision making. I was amazed by the fact that he continued to invest time in young students, thinking that this is his mission, to educate the next generation. I was also, it was also a pleasure hearing his discussions in seminars. You, always, you could always understand the paper better after Ovid presented it. He had special communication ability and a very sharp way of expressing things. During the eight years Ovid worked as a consultant at the research department of the Bank of Israel, he was dedicated to the goal of promoting the understanding of financial markets. He believed that the subject is not just interesting by itself, but that even in a macroeconomic perspective, there should be an important role for the size, the efficiency, and the structure of financial markets. During the beginning of the 90s, it was not so clear. However, today, after the world had suffered several financial crises during the last decade, it is better understood by economists and policymakers that fi financial markets have a real effect, not just a nominal one, on the economy. In that aspect, Ovid has uh, a large contribution to the Bank of Israel and the Israeli economy. It is hard to believe that Ovid is not with us. I miss him very much and have many times the urge to call him and talk to him. We had many plans for future collaborations. Among them was to write a book about the financial markets in Israel, incorporating all the knowledge we learned from our research together, together with colleagues, especially Shai and Asher. The idea was to build an overall view of the Israeli financial system, including financial markets reform, corporate governance, banking competition, universal banking and conflicts of interest, and more issues with the goal of drawing lessons for policymakers. I consider Ovid's death a personal loss 
and a loss to the Israeli economy. But his ideas and papers are with us and are quoted by students and policymakers. So in that sense, he's with us and will always be. start uh, the conference. Uh, we heard very nice words about uh, uh, Ovid, and that reminds me that uh, although uh, we were very good colleagues, we almost disagreed about everything on earth, from economics to politics uh, to uh, everything. And uh, we always spoke about it. And the one thing I think that we agreed upon was the fact that uh, we should always uh, challenge each other with questions, remarks, a little bit of cynicism, which is always a good tool uh, among human beings, and some uh, basic belief that uh, in this discussion both sides uh, means well. Uh, before we start, I want, you to, I want to read to you a few words uh, that Francesca uh, asked me to uh, read because she couldn't come uh, for a personal reason. And I thought, before I, I read these words, uh, I thought to put some words of this kind in myself before we start the uh, 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 second part of, of the morning session, but I think that after reading her words, you'll understand me completely. And I'm reading. I think, that, I think a conference is the most appropriate way to celebrate Ovid because so much of my memories of him are linked to economics and not only because, it, not only because we worked together but because he, he loved economics and it was a very important part of his life. I think we should all learn from his uncompromising approach since he only wrote about things he really loved, believed in. And if he had been at the conference, he would have grilled everybody with a difficult question. Uh, that's exactly where uh, I want to take us. This is going to be a scientific conference. Uh, this is how we thought uh, we, c we want to, uh, me to memorize or to remember of it. Uh, we still miss his corner in the uh, workshop room at the department where uh, you could anticipate getting the questions. And uh, I must say that I uh, expect the crowd uh, to behave exactly in that way uh, during the conference. A uh, few remarks before uh, I uh, give uh, Yishai the stage. Uh, first, this conference, uh, as was noted, was uh, uh, supported by the Bank of Israel, the research department, and by the Sapir Forum. Both institutions uh, did not give their support for uh, just being kind. They give the support because Ovid was an important member of these two communities. And as was said by Hedva, uh, who always wanted to influence the Israeli economy. And these were the channels that he was uh, working to. Obviously, uh, help from uh, the school, the Berglas School of Economics, and uh, from the Forder uh, Institute is also uh, acknowledged. Uh, we talked quite a lot about Ovid as a person, Ovid as a teacher, and uh, we will not discuss his politics today, uh, but I think we will all, uh, uh, we all uh, carry him in our heart uh, as long as we will uh, exist. Last remark, which is uh, all participants will uh, receive uh, volumes, the two volumes of his writings. Uh, I don't want you to carry the, this around with you all day long, so we will do it towards the end of the day. Uh, but uh, we, uh, if for each mem uh, participant of this conference, uh, we'll get the two copies to take home. Uh, let me invite Ishai. Uh, 
before which I start, like the rest of the conference from this session on will be held in a regular workshop room in the second floor. So people will feel better asking questions and uh, interrogating the uh, presenter. The, two, the first session is held here. Uh, I beg everybody to behave like in a regular workshop. If you have